Rub up your engines! Says. Scotty, with the rising gas prices, it's smart to get a slightly used 2020 Toyota Sienna. Okay, I would select. That's a very good minivan, but here's the problem. My son recently bought a new Toyota Sienna hybrid van, which gets really good gas mileage. And you might think, why did he pay so much money for a new one? Because in the Boston area where he lives, he priced used ones, and the used ones are going for more money than he could buy a brand new one for. And he thought, what the heck? I'll get a hybrid one, and it does. It gets phenomenal gas mileage for a van. And you might find the price differential between finding a used one and buying a new one is nothing. You might as well as buy a new one. Then you don't have to worry about anything, because yes, the prices have gone insane. And he found out that he had to actually pay a little bit more for a used one, then he paid for a new one. So he thought, well, if I'm going to get a new one, I might as well get a hybrid one. You know, I'm not a fan of hybrids in the long run, but still, it's a Toyota, and they usually go at least 150, 180,000 before they have any kind of problem. So if you get happy with that kind of mileage, go out and buy one. And the hybrid van gets, oh, you're talking about 10, 15, 20 miles a gallon better than the non hybrid one. It really gets phenomenal gas mileage in town for a van. It's just uh, the hybrid system is made for in town driving kids to soccer games and stuff. So you're picking a good van, but you might not be able to find a used one at any decent price. That's the problem now. Well, Ford's putting a bunch of money into these off road rallies like the Dakar Rally. They now have a mean looking rally ready Ford Ranger. They put a bunch of money for the 2020. It's cool looking, you know, because like uh, they're kind of mad because Toyota wins a lot of these. I always get a laugh out of these rallies and the competitions and stuff. You know, what do they have to do with the real world? If you look at the sales figures, Toyota Tacomas have blown the Ford Rangers out of the water in sales in the United States for a long time. Why? Because the Toyota Tacomas can last forever and they don't break down. Now, the Rangers aren't horrible trucks, but they are nowhere near as solid as the Toyota Tacomas are. Making this, oh, we race, we won this race, blah, 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 blah. Somebody wants to little truck that's going to last a long time. Do they really care if it won a race in South Africa? <laughs> they want something that's going to last, not something that was faster in some race in the desert. <laughs> Get carried away with this nonsense about racing and things. I mean, the reason that the Toyota Tacoma outsells the Ranger by far is that it's a much better built truck and it lasts a lot longer. And everybody who knows trucks knows that, and that's why they sell so many of them. They get advertised till their heart's content. They're not going to catch Toyota sales unless they make the trucks as strong as the Toyota, which they probably never will. They can never compete in the long run the way they build things these days. Now, price wise, they're competing with, you know, the new Ford Maverick truck because they're making them in Mexico. Mexico, right? And they're making them cheaper so they can sell them cheaper. And price sells a lot. Most of the time throughout history, the biggest selling models are the cheapest models that a company makes because people buy the lowest price models. Now, there's always an exception, like Toyota Camry sold tons of them. They were the best selling car in America for 19 years in a row. And that wasn't the cheapest car. The Corolla's a cheaper car, right? Smaller trucks. Of course, they're bigger than they used to be. They used to be really small. Now they're making them all bigger. Still, it's a smaller size truck in the United States. If you make something that lasts, as long as, believe me, you're going to sell the most of them, regardless of what kind of races that they win. A lot of these manufacturers don't understand that. In the world today, most people don't give one crap about racing any kind of vehicle. These NASCAR races, they're losing money. They're getting rid of seats in their big arenas because they can't sell the tickets. Modern people do not care about car racing anymore. When I was a kid, people were big on it. Now, hey, my kids and grandkids' generations, they don't give one hoot about car racing. <laughs> And these companies, they're living so far in the past, just we're winning these races. Nobody cares about it, people. The vast majority of people who buy cars and trucks don't care about racing anymore. That's a scene that they don't even follow anymore. People are not that interested in watching people going around in a circle making a lot of noise. Steve Kenner says, my daughter's 2010 Jeep Liberty won't put out much heat season. What could it be? Watch my video, how to fix your car's heater. It'll show you everything. Look at the temperature gauge, right? If temperature gauge stays around the middle, that means the thermostat is okay and your car's running fine. If it's running too cold, your thermostat's probably just wide open. Put a thermostat in, they cost like 10 bucks. Do that, could easily be fixed. Also, check the coolant level. The heater core puts heat into the cabin. 
it's one of the highest points. So if you have low coolant, air gets in the system and the air will fill the heater. The heater in a car does not work with hot air. It only works with hot coolant in it. If it's hot air, it'll hardly do anything because the specific heat of air, if you want to get into physics, is rather low, where the specific heat of water is really high. That's why if you go in really cold water, you'll freeze to death really fast because it sucks the heat out of your body much quicker than just air. So probably it's just low because if it isn't and that Jeep needs a heater core because it's an old heater core and it's worn out inside, it costs a fortune because of that horrible Chrysler design. You can pay over a thousand bucks replacing the heater core in one of those things if you pay a mechanic. It is a gigantic pain in the butt. Brian Dirk says, Scotty, did you like the X-Tool? They call it the DA, some say ADS. Yes, I'm totally impressed by that thing. It's like a $700 scanner and it works better than some of the $3,000 scanners I have. The company sent me every scanner that X-Tool has and for the money, that's probably the best scanner they do. They also make like a $1,500 scan tool, which is a little bit better. And for us mechanics, it really works well. But for most people, their D8 scanner is all you're going to need. LLT says, I've been watching since I was 12. I'm 23. I got a 2011 Camry. I was told it can go 75,000 miles with an oil change, but I do it every 3,000 miles or three months. Okay, they're insane and you're smart. You don't need to change it every three. If you use full synthetic oil, you can change it every five or so or once a year. If you use normal oil, yeah, go ahead and change it every three or once a year, depending on how many miles you go. You don't have to go all that far, but anybody that told you you can go 75,000 miles is out of their mind. You will ruin the engine doing that. I had a customer at a Toyota. He never changed the oil and he had 80,000 miles, but it started burning a whole bunch of oil and leaking because the oil was so dirty. He had to add extra oil in it. You don't want to ruin an engine for something like that. And he says, help, my car won't start. I got a Honda Accord 2009. I had my automatic transmission changed and now the car will start for two, three minutes, jerked and shut off and now it won't start. I took to an electrician. He said, everything seems fine after I checked the fuses. My scanner won't even detect the car. Help, I am in Nigeria. I've heard some bad things about Nigerian mechanics and it looks like you're kind of proving it. Now, you said you had that automatic transmission replaced, right? That's a giant job and I've seen this happen many times by poor mechanics. There's all kinds of wiring in there, right? When you take the transmission off, a lot of times that wiring's hanging all over and when you put the new automatic transmission on, those wires get pinched between the transmission and the engine when you bolt them together and it shorts out wiring and then scan tool won't work because if your wiring shorted out, your scan tool will not communicate because there's a short somewhere in the system. And since this all happened after the guy put a transmission on, he obviously screwed the job. I would take it back to that guy and say, fix it. You screwed something up. Now, if he says he doesn't know what he did, obviously he's an idiotic mechanic who doesn't know what he's doing. You're going to have to find out where the short. I guarantee you either shorted crushed wiring or broke sensors on the car. It's a big job putting a transmission in and he probably knocked wires, crushed stuff. Who knows what he broke? But since it happened after he put the transmission, I can guarantee you he screwed something up when he did the job. You might start by doing my video fixing a car that cranks but doesn't start up and see what's not working and then go through that wiring system. If the ignition doesn't work, follow the ignition wiring. Maybe you'll see some of them are between the engine and the transmission and they're crushed now and you'll have to cut the wires and re-splice them back together or take the transmission off again. A lot of times it's easier just to cut the wires where they're squashed and then just solder them back together. Again, they're color-coded. Black with red goes to black with red so you can fix it that way. Bass Head 4195 says, I recently changed my drum brakes and put new wheel cylinders. After attempting to bleed the brakes, I noticed the wheel cylinder isn't pushing the shoes in. Hell, most cars have disc brakes. People are used to them. They're, they're easy to work on. The drum brakes are a little harder to work on. What you have to do first, when you put those new brake shoes on, for the drums. There's an adjustable wheel. That's the tension wheel. You got to click it with a screwdriver. Keep taking the drum on and off. It'll spin freely until they're tighter. Eventually you'll get it so that you start, you click, click, click. You'll feel it drag a little and that's as tight as you want it. You probably just put them on, put them together and now they won't push out because they're not tight enough. They have to be adjusted. Now once you adjust them, the automatic adjuster does the rest, but that only do it once it's close. If they're really far off, say you might need eight or 10 or 12 turns to make it tight enough. You step on the Brakes, they won't come out because they're too loose. You have to pre-adjust them before you put it together. Once you get them so that they're tight and they're working, then every time you slam on the brakes going backwards, it's self-adjust or adjust them and keeps them tight. But they will not adjust themselves until you get them close and you have to adjust that little spur. I got a video on drum brakes. Watch it. You'll see how easy it is to do. It's not that complex. Diana says, I need help with a purchase decision. I've been looking at cars. The only options I have now are an 08 Nissan Altima 3.5 with 154 and two 2006 Honda Civic DXs. One 119 and the other 140. Well, it's a no-brainer there. Look at the Civics. Forget Nissans. Nissans are crap. Modern Nissans aren't very good cars. And that's the one that's got the V6 engine in the Altima. Overpowered. The transmissions burn out. The Honda Civic can run for 
ever. Now, you can't trust anybody selling a used car. You want a mechanic like me to check it out before you buy it. But the Civics are excellent vehicles. The mileage, yeah, you try to get one with less miles, 119 versus 140. But even with 140, they can still last quite some time. If a mechanic says, yeah, it's still in good shape, jump and buy the Honda. Do not buy the Nissan, especially with 154,000 miles. Odds are the transmission is on its way out with that kind of mileage on a Nissan. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.